sometimes with patients with heart transplanted patients for non-cardiac surgery. So let's see what the poll gives us. Well, uh, what is the most significant risk associated with anesthesia of the transplanted patient? 69% of the audience uh, tells us the physiology of the nerve-innervated heart. 0% intubation difficulties, 28% unrecognition of a rejection, and 3% uh, morbid obesity. And I think this is uh, well done. So thank you very much, Andrea, again for a nice presentation. And uh, then we go over to uh, the next step of this, uh, this uh, um, webinar. That means that... Um, we have a few questions in uh, from the audience, and I will go over to some of these questions. And the first question is a question to uh, my colleague, Dr. Marcin. Uh, is NRP for DCD heart procurement actually possible under UK medical law currently? Nandi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry for these technical issues. So as in my presentation and uh, also as Antonio reflected, uh, the NRP actually was introduced uh, by Pepworth Hospital. So the UK legal uh, framework uh, does allow uh, this modality. And um, indeed, uh, in the initial phases, the uh, vast majority of the Pepworth experience was done by NRP. The NRP is not only limited to the um, um, the heart, but uh, is uh, quite a favored uh, modality for the abdominal organs. So these will be, an, uh, and I reflected a little bit on uh, the NHSBT uh, consensus uh, that actually has two protocols, uh, even for the heart procurement um, with or without the abdominal NRP. Um, Antonio, being a national lead for, uh, for, uh, for donation, probably could highlight a bit more and why the decision was made um, um, globally, uh, nationally, to move away from an RP heart uh, donation. Thank you, Thank Nandi. You, Nandi. Yes, yes, the, the, okay, the just to add is, as Nandi said, is correct. So it is still feasible. And uh, from a practical perspective, I mean, we have moved more towards direct procurement. There are a few ethical um, issues, especially towards thoracoabdominal NRP. While from the abdominal NRP, there is a European consensus and there is a, 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 a clear a, a bet, or let's say a clear consensus that anyway that's feasible it does it is uh, a common practice for the thoracic abdominal nrp is uh, the ethical probably issue is a bit uh, more complex as nandi was mentioning on his talk the problem is usually related to the cerebral perfusion and then is rather than uh, demonstrating just the absence of flow is uh, actually the the the, the well you can demonstrate anyway that there is an absence of perfusion probably but it's really difficult to demonstrate that there is a real absence of flow and then anyway, we go more into probably details and terminology from a practical perspective it is still feasible there is still a lot of ethical uh, a discussion around the special uh, special around the ethical boundaries with that and uh, currently is uh, it is under discussion and there is a discussion along with the abdominal surgeon which have performed as well abdominal nrp uh, is whether we can probably demonstrate in a, um, a practical way whether there is yes there might be a minimal flow but there is no perfusion at all hence there is no function so the challenge is still there but hopefully it's going to be addressed from a practical perspective it is still feasible, but clearly it's making the donation organ donation community quite unsettled. So, and the direct procurement, as we have seen, has shown probably um, good results, and the results as good as probably the NRP so far. Okay, uh, Antonio and uh, Nandi for this uh, for this nice answer for this important question, I think. Uh, well, we have some more questions from the audience. For example, um, 
Is there any role of using a hemodynamic TE miniature TE probe, which can be used for 72 hours in situ in the postoperative period? And if there is, what is the cost benefit analysis using it? Antonio. Um, I don't have a personal experience with that in the way using a continuous probably for the first 70, 72 hours. Our approach, um, I'd say any approach, any any um, method methods actually uh, monitoring methods as long as the team is confident with that is is key and is important. What is important is possibly yes to recognize for the first, as I said, 12, 24 hours for the first hours, whether there is any change in function and output, whether there is any signs of um, pulmonary um, uh, of um, primary graph dysfunction. And you can do that with clinical signs, with uh, uh, hemodynamic signs, with central venous pressure. We personally use in, in PAPOT, we use and uh, the pulmonary artery catheter, and I guess um, in UK is, and probably Nandi has the same experience, so and Nandi can comment on that. So we, we use that, and along with the um, uh, transthoracic probably, and TOE when needed. Um, I'd say probably these are more gold standard, or anyway, demonstrated tools. So this is why probably we are more traditional, so we go for that way. Uh, but definitely, um, a 72 hours continuous monitoring, as long as the, the there is a confidence with that tool is uh, is feasible. Thank you, um, Antonio. Then I have a question to Vera. There is a question from the audience in patients with very high anti-HLA antibodies. Would you decide to perform desensibilization for heart transplantation or do you opt for bridge to destination assistance? Uh, it's a very individual uh, question because I think uh, most patients um, can profit from the desensibilization therapy. However, um, this is uh, discussed in an interdisciplinary transplantation uh, group uh, in our hospital. So, um, well, I think uh, in if it's possible and you, you have time, it's uh, the better way um, to to decide for hypersensibilization, desensibilization therapy, and then to go for transplant. Depends on the patient, I think. If you have an older, frail patient, like with a lot of comorbidity, so it would be the just the discussion to to to, to try an Albert with this as destination therapy as long term mechanical support. I don't know how the other centers uh, like Nandy or Andrea how how are you deciding these questions? It's a very rare phenomenon, but um, there are only a few patients. Um, you are absolutely right. We we have done it in in very special cases when when we had this transplantation or we exactly knew a kind of autoimmune disease which which is contributed. So in this case, we really consulted it with the uh, Austrian uh, Heart Center, and they actually I, I remind uh, uh, two uh, such cases when when we had a very very severe uh, HLA problem and in this case we really made a, a strict plasma phoretic protocol it's a very um i think it's organizatory very um yeah you, you have to to organize it a really good prior uh transplantation and uh, plasma phoresis you need the personal stuff for this and also with the anesthesiologist you need the nephrologist so but I think it's it's possible. We've we've done it a couple of times, but um, it's very rare. Fortunately, I don't, I don't think I can add much more. Uh, I I just again would like to emphasize um, the multidisciplinary decision making in this. Um, uh, we just like many other leading centers we benefit from a, a very very active tissue typing uh, uh, team 
and they are regularly present at the multidisciplinary meeting um, and they have uh, decades of experience uh, with all of these. Uh, I don't know if this question actually involves this, uh, the issue about the bridge to destination. It's a very difficult issue in the, in the UK because uh, legally we do not uh, perform uh, destination therapy. So there could be other bridging uh, methods, but these are, these are always very, very difficult uh, issues. I don't think I can, I can add much more to your previous answers. Thank you very much for this, for this answer. Um, but probably, uh, well, but then the next question, but that's probably a question that is related to all of us. What is your first line inotrope for cardiopulmonary bypass weaning during heart transplantation? And uh, well, I, I worked a three months in, uh, in Harefield uh, Hospital uh, with Nandi. And the policy there is different as ours, I think, in the Netherlands. We use normally a first line winning uh, from cardiopulmonary bypass is dobutamine together with nitroxide and norepinephrine. But uh, I think Nandi has uh, obviously, I think he's smiling uh, as obvious another idea. So, uh, Nandi, please. Well, it's not another idea. It's, uh, you know, you grow up with. Uh, with a variety of people and influencing and some people are more uh, powerful in making it uh, to the institutional guidelines. So um, the, there is no doubt the inhaled pulmonary vasodilators are first uh, um, line in all of these. We, we proactively use nitric oxide and uh, in my case is uh, inhaled iloprost. Uh, they act on a different things, but regarding the inotropic, the direct inotropic support, our choice is, is a low dose adrenaline, high dose nitroglycerin, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and noradrenaline for systemic uh, vascular resistance. So I think this combination uh, and relatively high doses of, uh, of, of, of uh, adrenaline, um, this is more to maintain the, um, the, the, the heart rate, the overall cardiac output, ensuring all the uh, benefits for organ, um, uh, end organ protection. Uh, the nitroglycerin, we believe it will reduce uh, the pulmonary uh, vascular resistance and, and providing uh, the, um, the help to the right ventricle while the norepinephrine maintains the uh, systemic vascular resistance, again, for RV protection. Uh, and we don't like weaning this very much in the first uh, first day or so, especially during the night. And obviously, we use um, a variety of monitoring things. Um, uh, Antonio touched on that. I agree that the first days are very critical in, in, in all of these. Uh, but I'm sure that, again, the same set of goals can be achieved with other, other, other agents. Obviously, the epinephrine and adrenaline infusions have a variety of metabolic side effects, and sometimes we start filtering for high lactate, which is probably due to adrenaline infusion. Excuse me, is there anyone who wants to comment on this? No, just saying that I think we can add probably all of us, we can give a different recipes. I'm sure if we, we will give five different answers, probably. Just to share, to say that probably uh, there is not probably one winning strategy, but yeah, it's... Okay, um, then I have one question to Andrea. Uh, this was this was an issue that came up in our center. Uh, well, uh, previously we had aminophylline or ophelin as tablets for uh, for keeping the heart rate a little bit higher uh, in tablets. But as these uh, medications are not available anymore, what kind of medication would you propose in these circumstances if the patient's heart rate is a little bit low and you want to increase that uh, with some kind of medication, tablets? Are there any other possibilities? Mm -hmm. So you, you need tablets and not during the, the anesthesia. Because in case of anesthesia, we, we, we just uh, uh, started a, a little uh, epinephrine and that's 
usually have so to organize um it's a very good question i really cannot answer it because we still in hungary we still had the aminophilin so it's not banned from the market so that's why we we like it or we like it eventually it's also let's say proposed for for a better kidney function so i i i stay here and and i really cannot advise any so i have really no I, good idea now for you eventually caffeine but but it's it's of course <laughs> another question okay thank you very much for this answer um then i would like to hand over to uh, nandi as my co-chair to uh, to summarize this uh, this uh, this uh, heart transplantation webinar and to give us a good take-home message. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, and on behalf of the transplant subcommittee and um, and and all the speakers, I'm very grateful for IACTA to organize this webinar. And today we focused on the perioperative challenges of uh, heart transplantation. And the classical saying and a classical vision is that heart transplantation remains still the gold, trans gold standard uh, for uh, surgical options of uh, end-stage heart disease. And we are all seeing these patients who uh, usually are cold, their circulation is limited, and uh, even a few steps are difficult, and they are given a few uh, weeks to live. Now, Obviously, this uh, has to be put in the context of advancement of mechanical support and long-term ventricular assist devices, but the, the issues with transplantations are, are, are remaining. And obviously, while heart transplantation is achieving fantastic clinical outcomes, successful heart transplantation and excellent uh, quality of life, we have to face that not uh, that heart transplantation is not readily uh, um, offered to every patient on the waiting list. Our waiting lists are increasing, uh, and patients die on these uh, waiting lists. What we have done today is that uh, uncovered or a variety of topics, selected five main topics uh, in this uh, theme. And um, I'm very grateful to uh, my fellow faculty members who are all leading and senior clinicians in their, uh, uh, their, their departments uh, in their country with a variety of national roles in uh, transplantation. So initially we thought to cover uh, at, at, at a period of transition or at, at the interface of mechanical support and transplantation and Vera told us uh, major advances uh, in total artificial hearts uh, from one of the world's most experienced centers in this. And there are major new devices and new opportunities um, and is a definite player uh, in bridging and also as an alternative uh, for uh, transplantation. I was tasked to discuss uh, the issues of the donation and uh, there is a definite change and move away from the old times where uh, a very good uh, uh, recipe or the donor was offered to a relatively low risk recipient coming from home. And um, the take home message probably from my lecture is that we have entered the era of machine perfusion uh, and this machine perfusion, whether it's the organ care system or the ex vivo, or uh, the uh, non-ischemic heart perfusion system offers new uh, opportunities to improve uh, the situation. Uh, we all touched upon, and there is definitely a bit of overlap between the presentations, but we all touched upon the importance of primary graft dysfunction. And Eric highlighted the clinical and biological determinants of primary graft dysfunction with the significance and also the particular role of cytokines and cell activation injury uh, in primary graft dysfunction, uh, risk uh, stratification for that, and some opportunities. And then this took us uh, to Antonio for the intensive care management uh, and his dual role both as national coordinator for donation and as a leading perioperative physician 
I really, my take home message from his presentation was the importance and slightly different um, attitudes for managing these very high risk patients. Um, and uh, that resonates very well with some of my previous conclusions that uh, the BCD heart transplantation is not business as usual and we really have to be on our tone. Uh, tools and uh, use every opportunities for the clinical, uh, intraoperative, and especially early postoperative post uh, periods. And um, the uh, last presentation uh, by Andrea highlighted that transplantation just doesn't uh, uh, stop at the perioperative period and leaving the hospital. These patients are coming back uh, for a variety of emergency or elective procedures and they represent a number of different uh, issues. Uh, the immunosuppression, their sensitivity for infections represents a major paradigm. And I think Andrea highlighted very well uh, strategies uh, for all of those and uh, the major physiological changes that we have to take into consideration. I think uh, heart transplantation remains an extremely exciting opportunity uh, for our engagement, for uh, leading local multidisciplinary discussions, put our expertise uh, on the table, making difficult uh, decisions. I think the future demonstrating 100% one year survival and, uh, and reductions in perioperative morbidities and even rejection by some of these machine perfusion technologies, 100% that demonstrates our capabilities to achieve transplantation at the highest level. And while these are usually not rep uh, reproduced in multi-center trials, but we have a standard to aim for and offer this uh, quality of life and successful clinical outcomes to our patients. So I think that's my take home message and and uh, we will produce this um, uh, final uh, discussion uh, for the ECTA website and people uh, signing up to the webinar would be able to review and, uh, and re-listen to some of these presentations. And uh, that is coming to an end and I'm grateful to all of our participants joining us on this unusual sunny afternoon Hopefully the rest of the summer will stay like that. Now, our president Fabio Garacciano uh, is busy to say farewell. And uh, let me then pass uh, the microphone to Professor Mohamed El Tahan, who probably the people listening to the webinar do not realize, but is the major uh, drive behind these webinars <laughs> as the chair of the education committee and reminding me to turn on my, 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 my uh, uh, camera uh, and is effortlessly working day and night for the successful uh, uh, webinar series and the entire education program. So, Mohamed, I, I think I said it this morning, but thank you very much for, for, for this amazing work that you do for the society and, uh, or the association. And, uh, and, and uh, with, with those ones, obviously, Mohamed is a professor of cardiothoracic surgery in Mansoura University from Egypt, currently works in Adamam, um, and is board member of the uh, IACTAIC and uh, chair of the education committee, and behind this webinar. Thank you, Mohamed. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so much, so much Matthew, for this is a very nice and time presentation. I hope to deserve half of this course. Um, they're all participants, uh, they're uh, uh, distinguished uh, faculty members. I am very grateful for all of you to be here tonight. I'm uh, thanking all of you on behalf of uh, Fabio Garashin, who's the president of EACTA IC and board of directors. And I have a special thanks to the sponsor of this webinar, Transmedics, which uh, supported this webinar with an un unrestricted grant. Otherwise, we cannot make this uh, free webinars. 
and the special thanks for uh, chair and moderators, uh, Dr. Eric Devel and uh, Dr. Nandor Marsden for the great efforts to design and plan this uh, webinar subjects, objectives, and inviting this uh, uh, renewed uh, speakers. Special thanks to all speakers for these very interesting talks. I have enjoyed them so much. I hope you have enjoyed them as well. A special thanks to people who are working behind the stage from AIM, the Secretary of EACTA IC, and technical support from Multi Learning to do this webinar. I want to remind of all of you, this webinar has been accredited to provide two CMA credit points. You need just to complete the feedback evaluation form before you closing your browser, and you can directly download the certificates from your end immediately after completing of the feedback. I want to uh, remind all of you about our next webinar. It will be on September 27, 2021 and it will be provided by uh, the Echocardiography Subspeciality Committee from EACTA, and the subject will be 3D versus 2D echocardiography in the era of minimally invasive surgery. Thank you again for joining us today, and uh, just a little housekeeping, unaddressed answers for the questions it will be answered by the faculty and it will be posted soon this week on the EACTA IC website thank you very much and I hope you have enjoyed it and have a lovely evening thank you bye bye